this is our end of average talk. This is all based on professional learning. So we're going to talk today about three um, people who will be talking. I'm going to, I drew the short straw, so I'm going to start. Um, and then <clears throat> Susan is going to follow, and then Sung will bring, uh, bring you all to your feet at the end. So um, these are short talks. They're interactive, um, but they are, they, uh, are similar to like a UDL talk. So they should carry a lot of punch along the way. Um, <clears throat> So um, I'm going to just go ahead and dig in. So I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Sue Harden, and I, <coughs> excuse me, I work in um, Macomb, Michigan. My title there is UDL coordinator and assistive technology consultant. So my job is to support our 21 local districts. It's a big county. Uh, it's right about in Michigan, we, we can show you where we live by doing this. So we put our hand up like that and we point to an area on our hand. So I live right about here, which is just outside of Detroit. Um, and we have 140,000 children in our district that we're supporting. So you can imagine that a lot, I don't have a lot of direct contact with all the children uh, individually. And we provide our support by providing professional learning opportunities for people in our district. So I'm going to share with you today our journey. We've been at providing professional learning for <clears throat> over 10 years now in the UDL field. And um, I'm just going to dive in because you'll, you'll hear our story as we go. Uh, it really is about this team. These are my colleagues back in Macomb. The four of us are what we call our uh, UDL Macomb team, and we together plan professional learning and implementation strategies for our local districts. So this is a story about this team, about Four Fingers, and about Buddha. Now that might sound like we're talking about a, uh, a journey at Travel Quest here, but honestly, our um, process has been a little more um, chaotic and probably better described by this. So I need a little sound there for the video. Well, there you go. <laughs> okay, so you can see it's a bit of chaos. Um, we really have uh, spent a lot of time talking about our journey and what we're intending to do with um, classrooms and with teachers as we're providing that professional learning. And this story is a little bit about our ups and downs, our mistakes, uh, the lessons that we've learned along the way. Uh, and as Katie mentioned uh, yesterday morning, failure is our best teacher. We learn best from our mistakes. So thinking about the 10 years that we've been doing this, I have a lot to share with you today <laughs> coming from that position of failure. So about a year ago, I started reading this book. It's called Advice Not Given. I brought it with me. Uh, if anyone wants to take a look at it. And it is... Um, by Mark Epstein, who is a neuropsychologist, and he talks about the eightfold path to mindfulness. And as I was reading it, I was really taken by how similar the things he talked about uh, mirrored the work that I'm doing. So follow along with me a little bit, if you will. He talks about connections and making connections to yourself, to others, and how important that is in our journey toward mindfulness. He also talks about making meaning, about finding meaningfulness in the work you do and in your day-to-day -day interactions. And he talks about intentionality. And he talks about um, being reflective. And he talks about celebrating. And he talks about variability. All of these are part of the thoughts that need to go into, uh, that we need to uh, capture as we're working toward our mindfulness. And what did that sound like to me? That sounded exactly like UDL. So those are all the things that I think about when we're talking about professional learning and UDL. And <clears throat> what really hit home was actually the second half of this title. It says, A Guide to Getting Over Yourself. So let me explain. Our professional learning providers spend a lot of time in the past talking about professional learning in terms of guidelines and frameworks and design. <coughs> and we didn't spend enough time thinking about the 
to teach her. We really were spending a whole bunch of time thinking about the pedagogy. And when we got over ourselves, when we realized it wasn't about us giving information that we've learned about UDL, that was really about focusing on the teacher, that's when things really started to change. So we took a step back and we said, it's not about the pedagogy, it's about the people. And so, um, we're gonna skip past that just in the interest of time right now. Oh, of course, when you say that and then it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> there we go. All right, so I'm gonna talk about UDL 101. How many of you in the room have taught UDL 101 in the past? A couple of you, great. A few of you have. Susan and I just did it actually on Wednesday. And so when, if you've ever um, provided support for teams who are just getting started out, UDL 101 is one of those craziest days of all, right? You're trying to think about, okay, I've got a brand new set of teachers who don't know anything about universal design for learning. I've got three principles, nine guidelines, 21, 31 checkpoints, and I have to talk a little bit about the environment, and don't forget, I wanna talk about variability, and oh yeah, I gotta make sure we talk about our beliefs, and there's so many things that need to go into that conversation that I find myself at the end of the day doing a little bit of theory, we'll do a little bit of strategy, and um, always promising, oh, we'll get back to that, we'll dig into that a little more deeply, we'll come back to that the next day. Promising more than I actually delivered. I always left that day feeling like I owed something and didn't deliver enough. So we got over ourselves, we took a step back, and this is what we decided to do. We decided that we were gonna focus not on the pedagogy, we were gonna focus on the people, and we were gonna talk about teachers as designers. So we spent time with all of the teachers in our, in our um, new implementation series and said, let's think about what we can do in our classrooms to make change. And this did two things to, for our teachers. It allowed them to take back their classroom. So for the longest time, they were learning about pedagogy and about content and the kind of instruction they needed to do. And oftentimes it was pretty scripted and they felt like they lost that uh, ability to make difference, to make change in their classroom. And so we gave them permission back to practice the art of teaching. And what that did was it led them to really think about their classrooms. So they made very small changes, but very intentional changes based on the needs of their students, based on the environment. And these changes, over time, added up to a lot. And it was just this idea of giving them the sense of efficacy, knowing that they had uh, responsibility over the, what happens in their classroom and that they could make a difference, turned out to be extremely powerful. So even after the first month, we had teachers already coming back and saying things like, this is a quote from our learning management system where we do our sharing and reflection. My students are really learning how they learn best. So already in the first few months, we were starting to see some of this expert learning pop up, which was really exciting. It's probably the first time we've ever seen that. And I like to share this story because I think this is uh, illustrative of how one small little change can really make a difference. This is a, a strategy called a four-finger affirmation. Any of you used this with kids before? Apparently this, have you used it? Okay, great. So apparently this is a really popular thing for athletes too and other people as they're facing tough situations. And I'll let this uh, delish, delightful group of kindergartners share it with you. So hopefully the sound will be working on this. And it didn't. Let's see. Well, we probably can't go back. So you probably couldn't hear the little voices, but here's what they did. I can do this. That's it. Just making it super intentional, represented by finger touching. We've given these kids the opportunity to um, persist and to be uh, fearless when they're facing things that are, that are difficult, like math for some of these kids. All right, so let's practice it. I want everyone to do it. You can choose, yeah. Choose whichever hand you want, left or right, entirely up to you. You're gonna start with your index finger on your thumb, and you're gonna proceed through the rest of your fingers, and you're gonna repeat after me. Ready? I can do this. 
Great. And use this. You can use this anytime. How many of you are going back to the airport in the next day or two? I might be doing it at the airport. I can do this. I can do this. And it's actually, you see athletes doing it when they're getting ready for really important events um, using that four-finger affirmation. And while this is a very simple strategy, it did two things. It gave kids the power to think about themselves as being expert learners, that they could tackle the hard stuff. But more importantly, it gave teachers permission to really think about their students as, as learners and how they were going to focus on um, changing just small things in the class to really build uh, potential for all students. I'm just making sure I'm not running out of time here. Okay. All right. And in the book, uh, the Eightfold Ways to Mindfulness, this is actually the first stop on the pathway, and it's called Right View. And what Right View says is that um, we have control over our karma. That means we can design with intention. We matter, and our perspective matters. And that's what Right View is all about. So this is stage one in our UDL implementation journey. Now, we finished UDL 101, and things went pretty well. Our teachers learned about design, and they designed some small changes in the classroom. But you can see that the path ahead is still a little bit foggy, right? In the past, what we would have done at this stage, we would talk about lesson design. Or maybe we'd uh, talk about accessibility. Or maybe we'd move into something um, about uh, uh, flexible technology. Or perhaps we'd talk about how UDL fit with some other initiative, like PBIS or PBL or some other ABC soup. Um, and while all those are good and important, we were worried about losing the momentum. And so we wanted to remind ourselves, once again, that it's not about the pedagogy, it's about the people. And so we did three things differently this time around. What we decided to do was to make our professional learning super teacher-centered. And we did that in three ways. We said we want teachers to think about their journey from a place of passion. That was the first one. The second thing we said was we want to be certain that our professional development, our professional learning opportunities were designed with variability, that we recognize that teachers are variable, that have variability, pardon me, <laughs> and, that they, and that we wanted to design for that. And then the third thing is we wanted to say to them and recognize that they are going to have their own pathways toward professional learning. Each one of them will have a different journey than the other. So here's how we uh, approach this. We said, we want you to start from a place of passion. We think that this is really one of the best ways to get teachers to buy in and to think about change, that it's something that is important to me. So we ask them, what's your why? Why are you a teacher? Why did you start teaching? Why are you still teaching? What is in it that drives you? Uh, and so we ask them to think about, why did they teach? And this is a word cloud of just some of the things that they told us about why they, they um, became teachers and are con continuing to teach. And notice they're all about relationships and kids and love. There's nothing really in here. I don't see math up there. It might be, but it's not the big idea, right? And so we wanted them to know that they could design for relationships. They could design for students. They could design for love and belonging and inclusiveness from a place of passion. And then we said, OK, well, let's dig in a little deeper. And we had two strategies that they could look at. So these are two that you might be interested in looking at for your teachers as well. The first one is uh, the School Reform Initiative Passion Profile. Uh, if you haven't seen the School Reform site, they have wonderful profiles and protocols for um, conversations with teachers and activities and such. And this one is a passion profile that um, describes eight purposes or eight reasons why teachers might be passionate about teaching. It could be about their children centered. It could be about um, the curriculum. Maybe it's about pedagogy. Another one describes social justice as a reason for being passionate about your education. And so we had them read those over and then find the one that most closely aligned to their passion and use that as the data point for thinking about how they were going to plan forward. The second um, document that I have a screen capture up here is the TSES, and that stands for um, Teachers Efficacy uh, Scale. So thinking about what they could have an impact on. What, what in their room did they feel like they could change um, that they would be responsive to and really design through um, making their classroom a better 
uh, place for students to be. And so we gave them those two options, um, one a lot more story-like, one a little more analytical, or they could come up with a way to do that themselves. But we really wanted them to think about their passion. And then we said, of course, we want to design for variability. And in this case, we were thinking about offering them options. So we wanted to give them lots of ways to interact with the content, lots of ways to reflect on the content, options for how they were going to share with each other, how they were going to share um, with the broader the school in a broad, more broad way. And so we really designed our professional learning um, with a UDL lens in mind, lots of active and interactive and option choices in, in our professional learning. And then probably the most important piece is that we really gave them permission to journey on their own, to find their own way forward. We said there are no wrong ways. We have different people with different paths and different strides. And we really want you to design for yourself. Now, our team at the time, of course, took a breath and went, <gasps> Okay, this is going to be kind of challenging, right? How do I support people who are all over on their journey? And so um, we're just getting started with this. So if you think I have an answer to that, I don't yet. But we're working on it. We're just a lot of conversations and a lot of support. And um, coaching is a big part of that. We'll talk about that as we move in. Um, but this is the second step in the Eightfold Path to Mindfulness. And it is right motivation. It's doing things with intent for the purposes of good. And so we really wanted to, our teachers to think about that as a place from passion, something that motivates them. So about this time, we're all through, through two full days of professional learning and co online conversations and coaching. And now we're starting to get into classrooms and do a loose approximation of instructional rounds. Susan's going to talk about instructional rounds. Um, so you'll hear more about that in a few minutes. But we started to do that where we go in and we watch them uh, in the act of teaching. And then we sit down and we talk about what they're doing. And if you've worked with teachers at this point in implementation, this is a really critical point. There's a, a, a big opportunity to mess up right here, right? So how we respond to this question uh, can be really important. They started asking things like, am I doing it right? Is this UDL? Are we at UDL yet? How's it going, right? They, and they were asking those questions. And, and if we said something like this, not yet, what message are we sending? Are we alienating people? So we wanted to be really clear that we wouldn't, this would not be our answer. And we also didn't want to go in the opposite direction, start calling out people who are really sailing with UDL, calling them UDL rock stars, because that really sorts people too, right? If you've got a rock star, who are the rest of us? So we really wanted to be thinking about in um, what's best for the teacher, not about the pedagogy, about the people. And we moved to this self-reflection and celebrating. And so that was our stance as part of our instructional practice, right? We wanted teachers to reflect on their own work. So we turned the conversations inward. We provided them opportunities um, and strategies and facilitation to reflect on their work. And then we gave them chance to celebrate. We said, celebrate the small stuff. Talk about the little things that are happening in your classroom. Share with each other. Share with the board of directors. Each, each school had a chance to meet to the, uh, go to the board meeting if they wanted to. They shared in their newsletter. So lots of opportunities for celebrating the small things, because this is what we know. We know that a jug fills drop by drop. And all the small things add up. And we need to be patient with ourselves. And we need to be patient with um, our, our professional, our teachers as well. So giving them permission to just celebrate the small things. In fact, this four-finger affirmation turned into five-finger affirmation. And now it's not just, I can do this, but it's also, I am super awesome, and uh, learning new things today. So the teachers made up their own things that went along with their four-finger affirmation. We just watched it grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, and this is right action. This is the third step in mindfulness. And don't worry, Sung and Susan, I'm not going through all eight. So if you're going, oh my god, she's on three, and we got five more to go, I'm not. But right action is, again, being very intentional and, and, and celebrating and being joyful. So having the right mindset to think about your work. And once again, we're at a crossroads. So what next? This is about the time where the teachers figure out that UDL um, says 
first of all, that UDL never ends, right? This is a problem-based thing, it's, and the problem's not in the student anymore. They come to believe that the problem is in the environment. They understand that. And so, whoa, what does that mean? All of a sudden, I've got this big lift, right? If the problem's in the environment, I got a lot of work to do. This thing never ends. It's ongoing. And that's important for us to get to because we need to know that we have to support each other along the way. So it's a quick story because I'm, I'm looking at my watch and knowing my friends are waiting. Um, so this is a story from the book. Uh, a monk goes, uh, leaves, and he leaves his family, his wife, and he goes up to the mountains to uh, find nirvana. He goes up to, to meditate for two years. And he goes there and he goes through his mindfulness practices and he reaches nirvana. He comes back down the mountain and he runs into Buddha and says, Buddha, I've, I've, I've achieved nirvana, what next? And here's what Buddha said. He said, after the ecstasy is the laundry. And he, met, and he handed him a bucket of laundry. And what this means is that even after we come to that realization, it's time to do the work. And it's hard work. And we need to recognize that. So the way that we recognize that is by grounding our people in community, saying that this is an important thing that we do together as a team. We reach back, we help each other, we have conversations, we have conversations with our coaches, with our PLCs, because a thousand candles can be lit from one candle and that flame doesn't get shortened. And so we're on our journey still. Um, we haven't come to the end. We're really only in March of a, a three-year implementation process. So. I encourage you to think about design and how you're going to design uh, for your professional learning opportunities and how you're going to build design and let teachers become designers and help them believe that they can uh, make a change, that they have within them the power to change things and that they can build places where um, students feel like they belong and are accepted. So I'm going to close with this. Let's agree that, ready? We can do this. All right, great, thank you very much.